Chug, 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 technical difficulties these last few weeks but we're happy to say we're ki still kicking and we're ready to bring you that drunk no vice commentary that you all <laughs> love and crave mm -hmm. yeah it's the best <laughs> so today we have a very special episode well not not special but a very serious episode very controversial episode because we're talking about the edh ban list since EDH is often considered to be a very casual format, people don't like to see this ban list because it kind of takes away from the fun and casual beer and pretzels kind of uh, camaraderie that comes with the game. But there is still a ban list like most card games where cards are taken out or kind of restricted because of their power level and especially in commander where it's a multiplayer format we take out some of these cards because of their impact on the game because they can often either reset the game put the game back way too much or just have much more 10 times more powerful effects than they were intended to have in the beginning so we're going to jump right into it. we got a lot to talk about. So, what is the ban list? Well, like most card games, Commander does have this ban list. And I'd like to say, in comparison to some other card games, Commander has a pretty short ban list. It's 41 cards with an additional 9 of those cards. Referencing the anti and then 25 more conspiracy cards. And so the anti cards are the cards that refer to betting. And conspiracy cards are kind of these uh, warp game effects. Like they have these um, kind of, they're kind of like the the cards that you put out and it changes like what planes you're on for Commander. Yeah, planes chase. Yeah, and those are considered to be okay. But the conspiracy cards I think were more one-sided than than anything and that made it a little more they were. uh unfair <laughs> to the game of commander since then yeah. you're even in this like multiplayer format yeah they so, just made it a completely different game it pretty much made it a completely different game from the get-go right so mm -hmm. on this on this ban list we would like to note that eight of the power nine are on this list the exception being time twister so the power nine being all the all five moxes, time walk, ancestral recall, black lotus, and time twister, and all, all of them, time twister is the only one that is not listed because I, to be honest, it, it's actually not that bad. It's just a very powerful card <laughs> for a low mana cost, but it's still not considered to be nearly as broken as the others. And so, with the cards that are cited on this ban list, they're typically too powerful for this casual gameplay that is Commander, referenced as Beer and Pretzels, and are agreed on, upon on the Rules Committee as being too powerful due to their effects with multiplayer format of Commander. Guy, what are you drinking? Tonight I'm drinking, tonight I'm drinking Guinness, and... I've already pounded down a can of wine, and so I pounded down the can of wine before we started recording, and I started to drink a glass of Guinness, and now I'm on my second glass, and I'm about halfway through, so that's all for me, and pretty much after this episode, I'm going to bed, because I'm, I'm already, like, pretty buzzed. From all this alcohol, and yeah. she's gonna put me to bed. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. You you just ride the wave. Um, I am currently trying to catch up to you. 
Uh, I'm getting there. I'm drinking scotch because I wanted to be fancy for this very special episode fancy of the Wizard boy. Staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, without any further ado, I'd like to dive in because we got a crap ton to cover and we need to get going. A so, ton. we'd first, I'd, I'd first like to talk about the fact that people take Commander and its ban list, like, a little bit too seriously. So... I'm going to give a brief history lesson that is 100% historically accurate. You can find Sentence it in a textbook. Books. Mm-hmm. It is confirmed 100%. So anyways, so basically, Commander started out with a bunch of MTG judges. Like, they they judged a bunch of tournaments all day, and they want to have fun and relax with each other. So they, like, sit down and they kind of make this game where... You pick a legendary creature as your commander, and you have a hundred cards, and they're singleton, and basically what becomes EDH. And a bunch of other people see what they're doing, and they're like, hey, that's pretty cool. And then they play it, and they're like, oh, that's really fun. And it becomes more popular and more popular. Lots of players start playing it. And so it became so popular that the EDH rules committee formed, which... I just want to say, the, the EDH Rules Committee is really just a playgroup of six people who have been playing Magic for a very long time, and they made their own ban list, and they thought, hey, this ban list is pretty good, let's post it online. And so, as time has progressed, and as Commander has become more of an acknowledged, promoted, and marketed format by Wizards of the Coast, because, I don't know if you know this, but Commander has gotten slowly more and more popular over the years, and... Wizards of the Coast has decided to use the EDH Rules Committee's ban list on their official website as the, air quotes, official ban list. And because of that, everyone kind of sees that and sees its officialness because it's backed by Wizards of the Coast, and they're, like, treating it as, like, sacred text, like, oh, this is the ban list. Oh, boy. And... I just find that really funny because, like, the EDH Rules Committee is, like, again, just a playgroup of six people who thought their ban list was pretty good and said, hey, people, check it out. And they've even said, like, hey, if you don't like our ban list, make up your own house rules, do whatever whatever you want. So (laughs) they're pretty casual people. Um, And now... Do you know if the people who are on the EDH ban list community... If those are the founders of EDH? Um, I'm not sure about that. Because that would be the really interesting The historical to... records do not go back that far. I don't know if they might, actually. <laughs> I don't know. The sacred texts. No! <laughs> the sacred texts. No! Our history, our culture. Oh, well. We'll, we're, we're just going to have to move on. Um, yeah. But anyways... Wizards of the Coast has uses the Rules Committee's ban list um, for like some level of standardization and commonality so that there can be official Magic Commander events, um, especially at LGSs. And, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but... Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. And so, so... That's the really... Yeah. And so there are... Normally, the arguments for the ban list and arguments against the ban list. Arguments for the ban list being that the ban list is designed to create as many good games of Commander as possible. These games would last long enough to be compelling, where epic things can occur, and where everyone has an opportunity to make an impact, which is very important, especially in a four player game where, let's say, you go over to play. It's not like you want to just sit there and not have done anything for an hour and a half which is kind of typical for most commander games but commander wants to allow for everyone to have some kind of say do something cool where they can lead the game and still feel like they've accomplished something even though this is a children's card game (laughs) anyway so the ban list also allows for games to be more interesting instead of going for obvious solutions Players are encouraged to research and find new outlets for common problems among their meta. So, to give an example, let's say, using the ban list as an example, let's say that Gifts Ungiven 
because it's a card I really love. But Gifts <laughs> Ungiven being a card that can easily search out some of your win conditions. That's a card that would go almost in every single blue deck. But it's taken out because it's so obvious and would be used in blue decks that now players are encouraged to go and find out something else instead. Um, I just want to quickly note, yes, we realize that we are being hypocrites because we just said people take Commander 2 seriously. And now uh, we're about to speak about it for like two hours. And yes, we realize we're hypocrites. Fuck off. Yes, that's very true because we, we, we want to kind of come at this at two different points. Really, the takeaway for a Commander is do whatever the fuck you want. Like... You know, this isn't a sanctioned event. This is kind of beer and pretzels, but this is very much like you go, you play, you kind of use this as reference. You just want to have a good time, but still, ban lists can kind of come in and help meditate that. Mm -hmm. So, well, what about the arguments against the ban list? What about those? There's tons of those. Well, I'm getting to that, Blake, so why don't you <laughs> shut the fuck up? So, Commander is a format unlike any other in that winning the game is not necessarily solely the objective. So, people would argue that the most important goal is winning the game. But for Commander, it's more about the whole experience because maybe it becomes more of an arch enemy situation. Where you're playing a game and you're just more trying to take down one opponent than necessarily winning yourself. Because that one opponent has won consistently. So as long as that one player doesn't win and you feel like you've helped, that kind of becomes an accomplishment for you. So, that's one argument. As well as, if a card is too powerful, that makes you an obvious threat. So, playing like Black Lotus or playing trying to think of some others um i don't know sundering titan or some of these like high level cmc creatures that are really strong effects once you play those that makes you kind of like oh it's, they're playing this it's and gonna turn into like, arch enemy is what's right. gonna happen it's like so, threat number one now probably in most situations nine out of ten right so if you're playing a card that's on the ban that would be considered on the ban list and you know, you play it, all of your opponents are now like, wow, this guy's a real dick for playing this card. We're all going to team up on them. That's your repercussion for playing such a powerful card. And I would think that the repercussion of you having to go book against three people kind of outweighs the fact that you're playing a banned card. And so now, part of managing this uh, list kind of leaves an open door for diverse styles of play. But if we start to overmanage, it becomes more of a single play lifestyle, which then the format becomes really redundant, which is very similar to how Blake and I felt when we were playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Because Yu-Gi-Oh! If you're playing a certain archetype, you have to go with the cards that are given to you. There's no other option, and you just go into that, and it becomes really redundant that this is how, once you draw into some of these cards, this is how the rest of the game's going. And it's not fun to necessarily do the same thing every time. Yeah, I will say that if you're not playing, like, Tier 1 Yu-Gi-Oh decks, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm sorry, like, I guess you're having fun with your Rogue deck, your Gladiator Beasts or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I do, I do think... EDH is much less likely to become like single play style because of how diverse the card set is over all of its entire history. But I do see what point you're making. So I'm going to let Blake take over here, but let's go into the ban list itself and talk about kind of a rubric that we see of what makes a card ban worthy in EDH. Yeah, so there's there's kind of two criteria in which Guy and I consider a card, whether it's EDH ban worthy. 
And so the first is too much value for too little cost. So it does too much for how cheap and inexpensive its mana cost is or something like that. And then the other category is clearly creates degenerate game states. And uh, like, like, you know, we all talk about like, oh, that's so degenerate, that's so BS, and but these are like clearly degenerate things, like, especially if they're being done early game. And I do want to say that these two criteria are not mutually exclusive. Like, because something has too much value for too little cost, it can make it so that it clearly creates degenerate game states. They are not like two separate categories. They can't. They kind of blend together, but these are the two like criteria that we generally consider a card to become EDH ban worthy. So for the cards fit too much value for too little cost category, we're going to start off like with Ancestral Recall and Time Walk. So these are good effects. They're good, like draw three or They're... take an extra turn, but for way, 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 way too little mana cost. These like, are really good effects for way too mana. Yeah. Like, this is, like, pretty much the epitome of this category. It's like, yeah, like, draw three, that's reasonable. But for one mana, like, one blue mana, no. No, 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 no. T like, take an extra turn with time walk, that's reasonable. But for, like, a, a generic and a blue, no. That is way too undercosted. No. Especially since the fact that Time Walk can be so abused with like something as easily as Isochron Scepter, where you take infinite turns. That's like, no. And another main point with this is the fact that Ancestral Recall and Time Walk are both thousands of dollars. And when a, when a single card is worth thousands of dollars, I argue that it just only encourages proxying. If these were legal in EDH, almost every single blue deck would run this. Like, or any card that splashes blue to some degree. It's like, why would you not? Like, it. On I argue that it. If this was legal, it would only ever encourage encourage proxying, and no one would able be able to get their hands on it because it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, this definitely goes into the reason of like obvious solutions that we mentioned, which was kind of part of the reasons for the ban list, is that no matter what blue deck you were running you would include these cards just because of how easily uh, manipulative their abilities are and it's also kind of important to note that these cards don't exile either they go to your graveyard so cards with snapcaster mage or like mission briefing one of the new cards from guilds of radnica which we'll get into later on in our series of videos because of how bullshit kind of this booster was but anyway so snapcaster mage and mission briefing are both cards that can easily then re-abuse these effects of ancestral recall and time recall because they don't exile each other then you can just recast them and since there's such low mana costs it's not going to be that hard to just play snapcaster mage mission briefing and you're like, okay, here's two mana, let me do this effect again. And you're just getting yards and yards ahead of your opponent. Yeah, so our, our next set of cards is, like, the Moxes and Black Lotus. So these are all mana rocks that are just completely free colored mana that are usable each turn. Like, this is the pinnacle of this category. Like, there's nothing wrong with being able to generate colored mana. There's nothing wrong with that. But the fact that you're creating them for zero mana, like, no, that's that's too much. That is crossing the threshold, and it falls again into the category of these are thousands of dollars each card and would only encourage proxying. Nobody benefits. Like, I would like to note that Maybe the Moxes definitely should be banned, but in the case of, for because it's almost like if you have a Mox, it's like an extra land drop per turn. But with Black Lotus, that kind of gets worse and worse each turn. If you draw Black Lotus on your first turn, yeah, you're gonna just get 
shoved way ahead of your opponents. But, like, if you start to draw that on, like, turn, I don't know, 10, and you're like, ugh, Black Lotus, I was looking for one of my key combo pieces, it's definitely not going to be necessarily as good. Guy, I don't, like, I see your point, but I don't care. The fact that you can't, the fact that <laughs> this is so good early game, so drastically outweighs the, the downside of its effects late game or mid game, is so astronomical that no there's a reason that this is bad i see the point that you're making and i agree with you but no no i'm, I'm not saying like let's unban black lotus let's 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 put it on the unban list i'm not saying that but i'm just saying that it it's kind of interesting to note that even though black lotus being the most expensive magic card out there that it it kind of its effects do kind of I mean still three mana of any one color at any point is great but like it, it kind of lessens throughout the game but the potential for it to be early game and like just break turn one wins yeah no I agree that it definitely should still be banned all right so our next uh, cards are channel and fast bond and they're kind of the same thing in the sense that you are directly paying life to add a corresponding amount of mana and they're like one green or two green mana and the fact that you can pay just any amount of life instantly to get equally amount of mana is just oh my god just no like turn one or two just get 35 or 35 or hell even like 39 mana for like anything like I don't even want to think about that that's just so gross yeah that's that's again too much value for too little cost too much mana ramp for too little cost like holy shit no <laughs> our next card is Telerian Academy um so it's kind of part of a just... cycle Yes, there's Telerian Academy there with for artifacts. There's Sarah Sanctum for enchantments, and there's Guy's Cradle for creatures. And I think that's the only, I think that's the entire cycle, guy, right? That's the entire cycle. There's been talks of like what would have been considered for the red and the black, but those were never made. Like there was, mm -hmm. I think, I've because I was like, oh, is there a red and a black one? But there's nothing for red, and I once saw there was, like, a black that was considered, like, creatures in your graveyard, which would have been kind of cool, but... Oh, oh, like, black mana for each black creature in your For graveyard. each creature know... in your graveyard. Oh, okay. I know what card you're talking about. I don't remember what it's called. We'll probably put it up screen on the video, because I'll figure it out when I'm actually sober, and, uh... I'll, I'll send it to you, so we'll put it up on screen. Anywho, the point is, Talarian Academy. You tap to add a blue for each artifact you control. The reason this one is banned and not the other ones is, like, the fact that there are so many 0, 1, 2 CMC artifacts that you can just drop, like, turns 1 and 2 and just generate so much colored mana. Again, you're generating... It's so easy to generate a ton of colored mana so early in the first three turns that it's just way more powerful than the others and god because it's way more difficult to drop man dorks for Gaia's Cradle or it's way more it's like impossible to drop a ton of zero or one or two CMC enchantments to like make Sarah Sanctum broken it's just not possible but with artifacts with artifacts it's possible and I know for a fact because if this wasn't banned i'd put it in one of my decks right away they did make um a, one of the, a nerfed version which is like that one of those enchantments that if you meet a condition it transforms into a land you know what i'm talking about guy i have no idea what you're talking about okay well there were these it's recent where um there were these enchantments where if you meet a certain condition the card transforms it flips and on the back side of the card it turns into a land and there's basically a red blue enchantment that if the conditions met it flips and it becomes basically a Telerian Academy and 
I can't again. I can't remember what the name of the card is called, but I'll send it to you when I'm sober, and we'll put it up on screen. And it's balanced. I think that's a really balanced way of doing that, where it's like inherently restricted, and then um, you meet the conditions and you flip it, and then it becomes this powerful card. And I think that's fair. But when it's just straight up, oh yeah, this is my first land drop of the turn, and I generate five mana or six mana, like. Fuck no. No, I, I. Now that I've kind of heard more of your reasoning, because I was kind of on the side that Gaia's Cradle would be. I think Sarah's Sanctum is definitely, of the three, the most balanced because enchantments are already kind of hard to get out. They're, like, typically higher CMC costs. Gaia's yeah. Cradle, though, you know, you can create, like, infinite not infinite necessarily but you can create a lot of tokens for two three card combos and then that means guy's cradle can create up to like almost 80 90 mana and then every turn it's becoming like a power engine but yeah. that's more like mid to late game and i think that's yeah, what this makes can be guys do- cradle this can be done from the very beginning Solarian right. Academy can be abused from the very beginning if you build your entire deck around it. And Correct. Yeah. It's just some bullshit. So we're going to move on to Yogmoth's Bargain and Trade Secrets. So these two, you're essentially directly paying life to draw a corresponding amount of cards. Like, it's just OP card advantage. Like, compare Yawgmoth's Bargain to Necropotence, and at least Necropotence drew you the cards at the beginning of your end step, so you, like, couldn't use them, and, like, you couldn't use them the turn you drew them, and then you'd often have to discard down to seven. So that was balanced. But they thought, oh, raising the CMC of Yawgmoth's Bargain, like, that'll make it balanced. No, not at all. It's, like, a way more broken version of Necropotence because you can draw those cards at the beginning of your turn whenever at instant speed and just play them and oh shit no 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 and then with trade secrets you can very easily just politic with your opponent and like any opponent you want and be like hey you want to draw like i don't know 50 cards or something (laughs) okay that might be an exaggeration but hey you want to draw like 30 cards and I'm going to draw 30 cards and we're going to get so much card advantage that only the two of us are going to be the like last remaining players and by the way my deck's probably structured around (laughs) in a way where I'm still going to beat you yeah let's do it yeah these are (sighs) definitely two cards like if this were a black or blue deck either exclusively or together automatic go in draw your cards and just for yeah. and a good CMC cost, I wouldn't say it's like super cheap, but I would say that it's like I think they're two and three respect. I mean, I think three and four respectively, where it's mm-hmm. you can just pretty much draw any number of cards that you need, and you're probably gonna draw into your win condition. Yeah, it's it's again, it's just OP card advantage. It's too much value for too little cost. You're drawing too many cards for too little cost. So we're going to move on to our next card, which gets its own category. It's called Tinker, and it's great, but it's too great. So I would really love it's... to see this card unbanned, because I would restructure <laughs> my blue deck so I could play these two cards together. Shut the fuck up. So, first off, it's any artifact... Okay, also, we're not reading the description of, of these cards, by the way, because we're assuming, like, everyone knows about the ban list. So, we, and we don't and have to read the And the cards are on the, are on the screen. Yeah, they're on screen, so just read the cards. But basically, Tinker, it's any artifact at the low cost of three mana and sacking an artifact. So, you know what you want to do? You know what you want to do? Okay, so you play an I. Okay, turn one. Play an island and a mana crypt. Tap both to cast Tinker. Sacrifice your mana crypt and bring out Blight Steel Colossus. Turn this one, turn baby. One. Turn one, Blight Steel Colossus. Baby. 
Oh my god. So if you're not playing white, like Path to Exile or like Swords to Plowshares, where it exiles it, like even if you have Pongify or Rapid Hybridization, I think those things are useless because actually they might not be. But still, the point is like turn one Blight Steel Colossus. Holy shit. Like you're gonna die next turn. And like who wants to die turn two? I mean, that's kind of funny. But like No, it's hilarious. It's, it's, it's gonna get old real quick. And like no, worst case not. scenario, it's like uh a turn two blight still glosses with an island and a soul ring. Like my point stands. It's like that's some bullshit. <laughs> Okay, like, <laughs> well, I don't think this is going to happen every game. I think this would happen more like 5% of games. If we're kind of like even doing for me, the that's, math. Even for me, that's too high of a percentage. Like a turn 1 or turn 2 Blightsteel Colossus at that percentage, that's too much for me. Like, And I think most players would agree. And if you're not getting a Blightsteel Colossus, you're getting some other OP bullshit like a Paradox Engine. Like, uh, just no. Mm -hmm. It's too easy to sacrifice some useless artifact to get some OP artifact. Like, sacrificing an artifact is not a cost at all. Like, no. Uh, there's just... It's too much value for too little cost. <clears throat> Anyways, moving on to our next card. We have Time Vault. It is way too easy to untap and tap Time Vault to take infinite turns early game. The card costs like two generic mana to cast and like it's way like with all the cards that have come out since its existence it's way too easy to untap it and take infinite turns like there's no way that this can be unbanned no i agree no yeah so that one that one card's real simple we're moving on to recurring nightmare which is basically an instant speed repeatable reanimate and like it's not as OP as all the other cards we have mentioned, but it's still arguably OP. It's still some like it's a repeatable reanimate and, and at instant speed. And I think all of those features combined, it's just it's, uh, no. I the one thing I would like to say is I would really like this is a whole nother episode to probably talk about. But I would really like to see some of these cards reprinted with better art, like Recurring <laughs> Nightmare. I know Time Vault got kind of that treatment with the online magic, as some of the Moxes yeah. and like Black Lotus did. But I would like to see a lot of these cards reprinted with some better art nowadays. I think like Tolarian Academy's art is fine. Um, Yogg's Moss Bargain, Trade Secrets. Tinker got that treatment. It was one of like the eight cards to be considered for that so that was nice because but yeah so i would like to see more of these cards get kind of that treatment but i do understand that since they are on the reserved list that they're not going to get that treatment they're too powerful and they're considered collector's items at this point so yeah well not all these ban list cards are on the reserve list but not all some... not all of them no yeah um, I mean, I do think it's possible to see these, like, online with new art, but we'll, guy, we'll never see these in paper. We'll never see paper new art. Fuck! Because if it's, in, if it's in paper, if it's in paper, that means it's probably going to be, like, standard, or, like, it. that means it's going to become legal. Like, if it's printed, like, there's a ch there's the, it's intended to be played, and do you see what I'm saying? No, I, I definitely agree with what you're saying, that it could then become legal in another format, and then that'll probably break another format, and then they're going to have to go into a whole thing, and I was, and it, it, I don't want them to do that at the expense of me saying, well, I hope this was prettier than it was before. <laughs> God just wanted pretty things, and he destroyed an entire format. Thanks, it, it was all worth it, guys. It was all for me. <laughs> don't worry the the smarter wizards of the coast will fix it don't worry okay. anyway moving on we're moving on uh that should be that should be our catchphrase of this episode moving <laughs> on moving on um we're gonna talk about profit accrufix 
So I've I've heard conflicting things about this card. This card specifically, um, because it's a more recent banning in terms of like all the banned cards. Um, some people advocate that it should be unbanned. Some people advocate that it should should have definitely been banned and agree with its banning. Um, I guess personally for me, in a focus deck revolving around this card to make the most of this card, it it's going to be a very, very powerful deck that whenever Prophet Crufix does eventually come out of the deck as the 99, it's 9 times out of 10 going to become Arch Enemy. Um, like being able to untap like basically it become in the right deck it turns into every turn your opponents take is also your turn because it's going to be entirely creature based <sighs> and i don't know because i haven't actually play tested with this card because there's in my personal experience i have tested with some of these banned cards and Prophet of Crufix is not one of them, and I don't think I've mentioned a card yet, which I have play-tested. I'm going to, but not yet. I would like to... I'd like to play with my... one. Of, I'd like to talk... I'd like to play with the person that first got me into this game, and because he argues that it's not broken. And I'd like to see him put it in his Simic deck and then see what actually happens, because... Uh, Simic it's on the, being it's on the, the blue and green because, guild... Because looking looking at our looking at our two requirements like two two little mana for two little cost it does cost I think five CMC so uh, I don't know it is five CMC but it is in blue and green but it is five CMC and it does basically let you untap all permanents you control on each of your opponents untapped steps and like. Uh, that is so much value, and I mean, arguably, it can create degenerate game states if it isn't the right deck. It's one of those cards that's kind of like right on the line, man. It's really hard to like define it across that one. So we're gonna move on because it's like we'll talk about it a little bit more later on in the episode. Um, the one thing on I would to... like to say, though, about this card is. Like, I get that it's in the two colors that could probably ramp it out a lot quicker than most, but it does have kind of like that, if you were to think of it as in Pokemon, you got your stage one, stage two, stage three evolutions. Stage three being Prophet of Crufix, the final evolution, the best of the three. <laughs> It does have a second evolution of Seedborn Muse, which is still could go into those green decks. And I think that card is a little more balanced. And if you're not going to run Prophet of Crufix, it could kind of go into there. What do you hmm. think, Blake? Um, maybe. I mean, you could put Prophet of Crufix in a completely trash deck like a complete trash Simic deck and like it's fine but like if you put it in like a finely tuned Simic deck it might be I don't know if that really addresses what you're uh, addresses what you're saying but yeah mhm mm yeah um anyway we are gonna we'll talk a little bit about more on, well, I'll talk a little bit about more with my thought, our thoughts about unban worthy or ban worthy cards, and this kind of falls into it. We'll talk about it later. We're gonna move on to Panoptic Mirror, which says, um, which actually I'm not gonna read the card because again we'll just have it up on the screen. <laughs> but basically, Panoptic Mirror allows you to imprint extra turn cards and just take infinite turns at five generic mana to cast, and uh, like it's five generic mana, like much easier than Prophet Crufix. Like, which at least has blue and green in its casting cost. And, again, it's like there's tons of 0 and 1 and 2 CMC artifacts to ramp it out, like, super early. 
and then it's super easy to imprint an extra turn card because there's tons of them at this point in EDH and you just take infinite turns and yeah just sorry no you can just start taking infinite turns as early as like turn one or turn two or turn three or whatever and I don't really want to play those games because I don't think that's fun no. and I think most people would agree with me I, I, I agree this. with that taking infinite turns because then you're not playing the game yeah you're how do you really. stop that no. <sighs> just instant speed interaction but it's like you'd have to build the, put a crap ton of it but and I don't really want to play that anyways we're going to move on to our next major category which is clearly creates degenerate game states Woo! All right. Woo! And again, <laughs> these categories of clearly creates degenerate game states and too little cost for or for too much value are not mutually exclusive. They're kind of intertwined, but anyways, I still kind of segregated them. Anyways, there's the 25 conspiracy cards. Nobody wants to play conspiracy cards. It's an entirely different game. Moving on. You're we a degenerate nine... if you want to. Yes, if you want to. If you find that fun, do it whatever do it with your friends yeah, plain chase is you, much man. better plain chase is better just saying um then there's the nine anti cards where betting okay if you want to bet go to the casino or something i don't know yeah magic really isn't wanna, the I place for betting uh not really like i mean you uh, yeah i just don't want to and i go to this i'd go to the casino for that anyways then we have Upheavals, Scheherazade, Sway of the Stars, and World Fire. All of these cards kind of do the exact same thing, which is basically just start another game. Yep, just whatever the game is like, just stop playing it. You might as well just start another game. Like, it just... just it, it, it clears everything. It just... Or resets life totals to some weird number and just gets rid of all permanents on the board or hand or graveyard or whatever and whatever it is you might as well just start another game these cards aren't fun and like i've played it i've played world fire in a deck it's like not that fun just start another game <laughs> yeah yeah i'll i'll um, say my thoughts later <laughs> Yeah, on this yeah card. we'll see your thoughts later. Yeah, so we're going to move on to Biorhythm, Coalition Victory, and Gifts Ungiven. And these are basically mm. what I call easy auto-win cards. <sighs> Biorhythm makes any creature-based deck almost an auto-win, where it, because of the format, you basically deal like 120 damage because you're going to put like one or two creatures on board, and then cast Biorhythm, and all your opponents are going to go to zero because you were able to get out your mana dorks way faster than they were, and that's some bull crap. And Coalition Victory is way too... It's actually way too easy to get out, like, lands that categorize as, like, the five basic lands and then a five-color creature. Just look at Transguild Prompt, like, Courier, Transguild Courier which counts as all colors and it's just then yeah and then gifts ungiven guy you kind of like this card but it's like a game i really like this card pop, you can you can create whatever piles you want and guy talk about gifts ungiven well gifts ungiven is kind of like creating guaranteed piles so you get to pick i think four card i actually have the card right next to me right here i can pull it out wait did you actually did you actually I, buy the card? Yeah, I did. It's our. It's on our Twitter. I have the card. So once it becomes unbanned, I can just play it. So you search your library for up to four cards with different names and reveal. And then you, you can politic your way because you choose target opponent. And target opponent chooses two of those cards. Put the chosen cards into your graveyard and the rest into your graveyard. So it's almost like you're picking four cards, any two of them that your opponent is going to pick, is going to lead you to victory. And it becomes this easy auto win of, hey, 
these are the cards that you know are gonna make me win this turn or these are the cards that are gonna make me win next turn so yeah Very so you admit that it's auto win <laughs> no i totally agree but like i don't know <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about it later in our uh ban or unban list all right all right we'll talk about it more later then all right so then we're gonna move on to um our next category which is kind of like all right so we have braids cabal minion leovold emissary of trust gristlebrand emrakul the aeons torn arayo soratami ascendant and Raphelos, Lanawar Emissary. So these are all legendary creatures that are, like, air quotes, broken as commanders. And I would agree with that. And my counter-argument is to just put them in the 99. Like, yeah. Um, each of these have different effects, that kind of make them degenerate as commanders. Braid's Cabal Minion kind of is a stacks piece. Leovold Emissary of Trest is an automatic game of Arch Enemy where you need to kill them right away or you're just never going to draw cards and never be able to play cards. Gristlebrand is just... Um, as soon as he gets out at instant speed, draw all the cards and play all the cards and win. <laughs> Um, Emrakul, even though he's 15 generic mana to cast, um, like, it's actually not that difficult in the, like, perfectly built deck to get him out pretty early and then just have some OP bullshit creature. Um, and then the Areo Ascendant just it's there's cards that say you can only draw like one spell a turn and then nobody plays any cards ever and then with um Raffelos Lana War Emissary I don't know I've seen a few like EDH decks of him and he just ramps so fucking hard like holy shit and you, you just do so much so fast um so as commanders, I personally think that there's that that's a good reason that they're banned. But as the 99, they might be okay. Um, I think you'd have to ban early mana ramp and tutors for that. But I'll get more into that later. Um, yeah, they're just like they just do too much for too little in that category, and they just create degenerate game states. And I think that's why they're banned. Yeah, but when we were making these notes, I do want to say that guy was like, oh, Leovold, I wonder how much he has foiled. Only $200? Ooh, I kind of want to build him now. <laughs> yeah, Blake and I have kind of this unspoken... When we build com decks as for our commanders, we have to make sure that our commander can be foil. Because if there's going to be any card that's going to be foiled in our deck, it's going to be our commander. And so that does take like a high consideration into when we build some of our decks. But Leovold, Emissary of Trust, has only been printed once. And he was probably printed about eight years ago, I think. And his foil version is worth $200. And I know just... From looking at some like preliminary preliminary deck lists of him, he would be worth the two hundred dollars buying the deck, cause he would be so strong. But I I don't see that being hap I don't see that happening in the future that he'd be considered. Oh, let's unban him. So I don't know if I'll actually build him, but I think that the $200 for a foil version, if he were unbanned, would be worth the build. You uh, you figure out whether or not you want to pay $200 for a single card. Well, um. now I'm up to $150 paying for one single card. So I'll have to <laughs> think about don't it. Get, don't give into it. No. <laughs> no. I like how it's the same card that we both paid for. We both bought uh, Mox 
diamonds. And that's, that's too rich for my blood. I'm never going to buy another car that expensive again. Blake paid 210 and I paid 150 <clears throat> because mine's very slightly ripped. But Very slightly. Very slightly. But for that amount of value and in <clears throat> that much card, because it's only going to go up in price from here, worth it. Okay. Worth okay, it. Sure. <laughs> okay, moving on. We got limited resources and balance, and these are just hard early stacks pieces, and in my opinion, balance might be okay unbanned. I mean, it's only a sorcery and not an enchantment, which, uh, yeah, I think for that reason alone, like, balance might be okay. They recently, like, you know how they do, um, like, Magus of the Blank cards guy? Yeah. Yeah, I know what like you're they talking made, about. They recently made a they recently made a Magus of the Balance, and like, I'm really glad that Wizards of the Coast does that because it's like, it makes a really really powerful card on a stick, a creature, which is arguably a much easier permanent to get rid of, and I think that definitely balances it out, pun intended. Um, it definitely balanced it out, <laughs> but now I'm like, okay, this card sucks. To be honest. Yeah. Because it's like, I think it's three mana for the creature, and then it's five mana to use its ability. And is you wouldn't even be mana? able to... Is it five mana and tap? I'm not so sure about that. I think it's five mana and it's tapped. It'll be up on the screen, and I'm pretty sure it's five mana and it's tapped. All right, but regardless, it's like... I think even as a sorcery, it's fine. I think it might be unbannable. Um, like, it's 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 all right. It's four and oh shit, you're right. Holy fuck! I know I'm right. Ha. Huh. It's it's four and a white and then tap. Okay, yeah, the, the creature is so fucking balanced. Like, the, the... oh, the creature's two, not three. Yeah, but still, it's really balanced. Again, pun intended. Anyway, ha ha. So. <laughs> God damn it, guy. Why do you have to be right about things? Um, next, we're going to move on to Chaos Orb and Falling Star. Both of these are the sort of cards that are, like, actually care about the physical space of, like, the table and, like, 3D, like, space on the table. And it's all about, like, dropping cards. And it's, like, just bullshit, kind of. It's just, it creates a mechanic in the game that I don't really want to play with. I've heard stories about people ripping up their chaos orbs and just, like, sprinkling it across um, the entire table and destroying fucking everything. I would say if, you know, if the ban list were limited to two cards, if only there were two cards on the ban list, these were the cards that I would put on the ban list. I think that this is a very dumb mechanic because I think you can make it very easy to just kind of get rid of whatever you want. And I just think this is just a old, dumb rule. Yu-Gi-Oh! I think does it a little better with terms of like space of the board. Where it's like, okay, in zones 1, 2, and 3, these cards are now destroyed. Or like zones 1, 3, 5, whatever. But it doesn't go into the mechanics of like, oh, let me just like slightly hold my card above the one card that I want to get rid of. And then as I drop this card, it's going to land on this card, obviously, and get rid of it. Yeah, and the thing I have to add to that is with Yu-Gi-Oh!, with the recent leak mechanic, it like only after the link mechanic was introduced did we actually care about which... Um, physical locations you put the cards in your monster card zones and so it's recent so like the, the card game's been out for a long time and konami air quotes knew what they were doing and with chaos <laughs> orb and falling doing. star yeah yeah they never know what they're doing um chaos and with chaos orb and falling star these were like original magic cards and before like magic was really kind of finding itself and solidifying into what it was and that's arguably why a lot of these cards are banned is be before Magic really knew what it wanted to be and found a balance of like what cost a certain amount 
to do a certain effect. And so, yeah, like, they're just not fun cards to play. You just... We don't care about the physical space of things. Anyways, we're moving on to Caracas and Library of Alexandria. These are both just very weird lands. Um, I personally don't think they are OP. Um, I think they are just annoying. Um, I would really actually appreciate people explaining to me why they're on the ban list. Because they're just kind of annoying. Like, one kind of just like draws you cards if you have exactly seven in your hand i would really actually appreciate someone explaining to me why this is broken is there some way to like guarantee that you only ever have seven cards in your hand or is there or is there some way to like infinitely tap or untap this to draw your entire library i i actually don't know and i want you guys to explain it to me i agree I, that I, I think between the two library of ang Alexandria is kind of the more I don't see this I guess if it's like drop free card draw that's like maybe but like the fact that you need exactly seven cards in your hand is kind of like what makes it like semi balanced but like I definitely see yeah. like Caracas is banned because it says tap return target legendary creature to owner's hand that specifically then refers to any commander that's out on the field, and that kind of so, ruins. So is, so is it just banned because it's like it could, in theory, be tapped and untapped um, indefinitely, and no one can ever play their commander? Is that the idea behind it? Like, I'd like to say that guy and I like in the time it took to put out this episode that's why it's so late is because we tried to do justice to this episode we tried to like do research into all these and i couldn't find a valid reason why caracas or like library of alexander library of alexandria was banned i would definitely say i think caracas <sighs> should be unbanned like because of this because this could also refer to your own commander and then if your commander returns to your hand you're then able to recast it for no uh commander tax and i think that can be kind of broken because you can then kind of use that at instant speed so yeah. i think that makes it a little annoying if not like yeah. broken but a library yeah. of alexandria i would like to know a better reason for why that card is banned yeah i honestly didn't think about that guy it's like is it because it's like land-based protection of your commander where you're because it goes to your hand, you don't have to pay the commander tax, but, like, even so... I think that's the reason for Caracas, absolutely. That Caracas just kind of ruins the mechanic of commander cards, but I still am not 100% on why they banned Library of Alexandria. I would love okay. to see kind of that reason. Okay. Maybe it's because it would go into every single deck, but I don't know. Okay, well, we'll move on to our next category, which is Sylvan Primordial, Sundering Titan, and Primeval Titan. So, these are all creatures that have ETBs or attack triggers that generate a bunch of land ramp or land destruction. Um, these are, they all have high CMC um, and they're all easily abusable with any sort of flicker deck or copy deck or both um if they were unbanned they would almost become like auto includes in many many edh decks because they are just such high value creatures even though they cost a whole bunch and they are creatures and they're easy they're like the easiest permanent type to remove they're still like really fucking strong what do you think guy <laughs> no uh, i'm like the fact that it's whenever it enters the battlefield i don't know 
if it's if there is a card that's like you can only use this effect once per turn because that's definitely a thing yeah. in Yu-Gi-Oh at least but yeah cards if that if that was like but I feel like that would also loot ruin the flicker ability maybe I mean yeah. flicker still kind of allows for some protection but flicker then allows you to abuse the shit out of these effects that oh. are just way too powerful oh yeah and i would like to say um i have play tested sylvan primordial um like my my friend put it in his simic deck and basically he used um progenitor mimic to make a copy of sylvan primordial at the beginning of his upkeep every turn and oh my god it just became arch enemy and it went so downhill for all three of us like it became arch enemy but we still couldn't do jack shit against him because oh my god it was just so much value against us and we were so fucked <laughs> Because these creatures also still have... It's not like high CMC for a low attack and... Uh, not attack and defense. Uh, power and toughness. It's like high CMC for a high power and toughness and a really good effect. It's not like yeah. they try to balance it by saying, Okay, well this creature, even though it's going to cast for 8, it's going to have a 2 and 2. If you are, like you said, creating multiple copies of this card each turn, you have then an army of 8-8s eight or whatever that are now just flooding the field, and it's going to be hard to then kind of get rid of those on top of the fact that these cards are now uh, doing these effects that destroy your land base or whatever. Yeah. And I do want to quickly add, like, I asked um, one of my friends in my playgroup um, about these cards. And so one deck he runs is Omnath, Locust of Rage, which is all about lands. And I asked him, like, hey, would you run Sylvan or Primeval? And he's like, I would definitely run Sylvan Primordial because I could abuse the absolute shit out of it. And then I asked him about Sundering Titan, and he's like, oh yeah, I definitely put that in my Kozilek Distortion um, deck, and he would basically turn it into a colorless Stax deck, and I know for a fact with how many um, copy effects, for like copy artifact spells there are, or whatnot, in that deck, he would just abuse the absolute shit out of it, and... So, again, if any of these cards were unbanned, they would become almost auto-includes in a lot of decks. They would just... And I and I don't really know if I'm okay with that. So, yeah. We're going to move on to our very last card on the ban list. Thank you for sticking with us after all this time. <laughs> our last card is Painter's Servant. And, like, when I started this episode, I'm like, oh, Painter's Servant is, like, okay. Like, it only combos with Grindstone. And then Guy was, and, like, a couple of other cards. And I'm like, well, okay, two-card combos are, like, kind of annoying, but they're okay. Um, and then Guy told me about the whole um, Painter's okay. Servant... I have, yeah, like Ugin the Spirit Dragon, where you just destroy everybody's lands every single turn. And again, my friend who runs a Kozilek Distortion deck would just abuse the shit out of this with the Sundering Titan on top, the cherry on top. <laughs> and and then I was like, okay, nope, nope, nope. Painter Servant can stay banned. Painter Servant can stay banned. Uh, that's fine with me. Yeah. We're going to go into a little more about what cards we think are ban worthy that are not on the ban list or what cards are unban worthy. 
but Painter's Servant was one that Blake Blake brought up that like, yeah, why why is this card banned? And I was like, I guess maybe I don't know Grindstone or, you know, you got Iona, and that kind of locks locks you out of your deck if you're playing against that. But if you have Ugin the Spirit Dragon, you can use his minus X ability for almost a zero Armageddon every turn that then definitely locks out all of your other opponents. Yeah. And you this is one of those cards that creates degenerate game states. Should I I I'm now I was kinda like fifty fifty, but now I'm more like Let's keep this card banned. I think this is one card that enables too many of these two card combos where it's like if you get rid of this card then nothing is going to be like lost from the game, I guess. I mean, I was just wanting to put it in my Una deck where like I declared a certain color and then like they exiled a certain number of cards and I would guarantee get a certain number of like flying 1-1 one, one fairy rogue creature tokens and so i was thinking about it very casually but as soon as you as soon as guy pointed out to me like how many two card combos and degenerate things you can do with it i'm like <sighs> it should stay banned <sighs> right oh wow well. yeah and to conclude our section about um what we consider to be banned worthy cards i just want to make a quick note that um Using these two criteria, like this is why people may hate or call for banning of mass land destruction or stacks effects. Um, they can create degenerate game states, but in my opinion, they are viable win strategies in their own that occur mid to late game. And mid to late game, opponents can respond adequately with cards. But all the cards we previously mentioned up until now are banned because they can be done so early in the game um, or they have little to no time for responses to occur to be stopped. And so for every person who complains about mass land destruction and stacks effects, just grow up, I don't know. <laughs> To kind of conclude yeah. also this going through each or most of the cards and kind of where they fall. But it is interesting to note that no plans, Planeswalkers have been banned on the list yet. I mean, that's an entire different discussion as to whether Planeswalkers are any good in EDH or not. Like, we, we're probably going to do a, an episode on that all on its own. But, yeah. Thanks for bringing that up, guy. Yeah. 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 So now we're going to kind of go into the cards that we deem either ban or unban worthy. These are.